The NSF GK12 project at Colorado State University is translating fellow research into the science classroom at three regional high schools by engaging the students in a transdisciplinary research and design project that mirrors at a macroscopic scale what CSU researchers are doing at a microscopic scale. CSU faculty and fellows from the departments of biomedical sciences, chemistry, electrical and computer engineering, mathematics, and computer science are developing a hybrid imaging system for tissues that combines traditional optical microscopy with chemical imagery gathered from a novel biosensor array. The system will allow optical images and maps of chemical concentrations throughout the sample to be gathered and analyzed in real time in living tissue, advancing our understanding of the chemical factors that influence cell movement and organization. Rather than simply present this research directly in the K-12 classroom, we decided to pose the same essential question that CSU researchers are trying to answer, but in a context that the students could work with. Our research on cells and the chemical cues that motivate their migration and organization was essentially a study into what motivates a biological organism to move. Instead of presenting the students with cells and microscopes and telling them what real scientists do, we chose to let them be real scientists for themselves. We selected an organism that they could work with directly, in our case, wood ants, and asked them to answer the same question, what motivates this organism to move? We then gave them the opportunity to experience the process of developing an idea for an experiment to answer the question, to engineer their design into a working apparatus, to execute the experiment and collect the data, and then analyze the data and report their results. We started with three high school science classes where a teacher was paired with a fellow from CSU. In our case, we had a mathematics class, a physics class, and a chemistry class. But the interdisciplinary nature of the program means it could be used in almost any STEM class. We'll follow the progress of one of these classes, an honors pre-calculus class at University High School in Greeley, Colorado. Within the classroom, we introduced the students to the idea that they would be designing their own experiment to answer a genuine scientific question and that they were not going to be just recreating an existing result by going through a set of steps outlined on a lab worksheet. This was a new experience for most of the students and they were a little unsure about how to even begin. At this point we delivered a set of essential lessons that we felt the students would need to enable them to succeed. For example, one lesson discussed random motion and random motion with bias. We took the students onto the football field and gave them spinners or dice that sent them off in random directions for random distances. We periodically blew a whistle which gave them a directional signal. They took several steps toward a flag when the whistle sounded. Their graphs of their paths looked very similar to the CSU researchers' plots of cell motions and later on to the students' own observations of ant movements. During this time, we also selected student leaders for the project, who we called junior fellows. This was a competitive selection process where students submitted resumes and cover letters and we held formal interviews to select the leaders. This not only identified our leaders, but it gave the students some practice in writing a good resume and interviewing. Once the junior fellows were identified, we brought the teachers and the junior fellows to CSU where they could meet the project team and tour the labs where CSU's research took place. Our goal was to make the students and their teachers feel like they were a part of a larger scientific community and open their eyes to the possibilities when groups of scientists and engineers in different disciplines work together. Once the essential lessons had been delivered and the junior fellows selected, we divided the class into teams, each led by a junior fellow, and the teams got to work. Each team discussed the question and decided on a particular experiment they wanted to perform. Then the teams wrote up formal proposals and submitted them for approval and review. The teacher and CSU fellow evaluated the proposals, which each had to have an abstract, a description of the research, a timeline, materials requirements, expected results, roles and responsibilities of each team member, and a bibliography listing prior work the team had found that relates to the experiment they proposed. As before, this had two goals. It gave the teacher and fellow a checkpoint to make sure the students were on track, but it also gave the students exposure to the proposal and evaluation process that's an essential part of modern science. Once the proposals were approved, the students got to work building their experiments. They had complete control over the design of their apparatus. The teacher and fellow provided almost no input at this stage except where potential safety hazards might exist. For example, 
One team wanted to test the ant's reaction to smoke by building a fire and blowing smoke across the ant's habitat. The teacher and fellow suggested liquid smoke might be a safer alternative and might still show the same effect. In general, the students were free to design whatever apparatus they needed to execute their proposed experiment. They also had to design a habitat where we could keep the ants that weren't being used during experiments. When each team's experimental apparatus was complete, we ordered the ants. From then until the ants' arrival, each day the students were asking, are the ants here yet? When they finally arrived, we went into high gear and the students got to try out the experiments they developed. It was an exciting moment, but not without challenges. Many of the experiments didn't go quite as planned. The ants moved around more quickly and behaved more randomly than most of the students expected, and their experiments and data collection methods had to be quickly modified. Let's check in at this stage with one of the other participating high schools. Teachers Scott Kent and CSU fellow Zach Cachero at Berthet High School in Berthet, Colorado have been running this experiment in a physics class. The two teams, under the leadership of their junior fellows, have created very different experiments than those created at University High School. One of the teams used an arrangement including a laser and photo detectors to track the movement of ants across a bridge seeing when they move from one side of an apparatus to the other. When the dust had settled, the groups analyzed their data, created charts and graphs, and the junior fellows worked together to write a report with their findings and to create a research poster that illustrates what each team found out. They presented their results formally to the class and then traveled to CSU once more to display their poster and experiments at the Exploring Engineering Day along with the teams from the other two participating high schools. When asked about their experiences at the end of the project, the students felt more capable of taking on new problems and more comfortable with the idea of posing their own questions and designing experiments to answer them. They saw the power of teams working across multiple disciplines and learned the importance of clear and easy to understand communication and teamwork. We hope they will be more excited about STEM subjects, more willing to take challenging STEM courses, and more likely to choose a STEM career and become future leaders in science and engineering. Whenever we got thrown into this experiment, we kind of floundered for a while. We really didn't know where we were going to go with it. We spent forever designing our experience trying to figure out what to test exactly. And now that we've gone and done this, I think we would be able to evaluate things much quicker and take on just about anything. Well, we're used to having the, the steps of the scientific procedure and everything listed. We're used to having that. And when you don't have that, it, it's an entirely different experiment. You have to run it yourself. You have to decide exactly what your problem is and how you're going to look at it to solve it. With this, we did all on our own. We didn't really get too much help. We had to figure it all out. We had to fix it. We had to figure out what we're going to do. And we had to find the results ourselves. Nobody knew what the results would be, but so we had to figure it out. I think it was more like real, what real scientists do because they don't have someone telling them like, oh, this is going to cure cancer. They just have to come up with the ideas themselves and put them to work themselves. So now that you've gone through this, what if we give you another problem? We'll solve it. I hope you've enjoyed this short presentation of our experiences. And I hope seeing what we've done will help you go forward and bring your research to your K-12 students.